I'm on page 33. And this is really focusing on quite a bit. It's kind of overarching a lot of good stuff about the class. So you can pick two different things and try and test them. Agree? Yeah. Okay. So you could do a study of students' high school GPA versus how much they eat. Is there a correlation to it? I mean, do smarter people not eat as much or eat more? But what do you think? Like, get, give me an honest thing. Like, G, high school GPA versus how much, how many calories are eaten each day? You think there's some sort of correlation to it? I don't know. What what about what about uh, the how many cars are at your house versus how many times you go to Starbucks a week? I mean, like, like you, you could pick two very different things, and you might be able to collect data to show that you have some sort of representation to it. And a lot of times we do with linear, you know, linear regressions. But the thing is, we have, you know, linear regression, we have quadratic regression, we have polynomial regression, we have exponential regression or natural log. I mean, there's just all these different types of things. But the hard thing about when you are collecting data and trying to make a point about something is one, you have to create, and this is like many chapters away, but you want to create a random number generation system in order to assign people. Now, do phone surveys work? Maybe back in the 80s, in the 70s, when it wasn't, you know, like if your phone rang, it was kind of like a treat. I don't know about y'all, but we still have a home phone. The only reason we have a home phone is because it's bundled with my internet and my cable. And if I get rid of my phone, my cable bill goes up. So the home phone rings. And what does the stir up household do? Yeah, ignore it. Like, who the heck's calling that? They want to call me. I got a cell phone. My wife has a cell phone. Daughters have cell phones. But it's like really rare. So, so these days, you get these things. Hey, we have a quick survey. Uh, hang up. I mean, it's pretty rare that 100% of the population is always is going to participate in a phone survey. I'd say it's a pretty small percent of people. I don't want to be bothered by this. Plus, the survey, you know, there are some times, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I should not have a phone during the summer. Because sometimes I have more time than I know what to do with. Will you do the survey? Sure. They'll ask me the first question. That's really not a good survey question. No, just answer the question, sir. No, I'm just letting you know that's not a good survey question. Perhaps you should phrase the question this way. In fact, would you put me on with your manager, not let me explain to your manager how that is an inappropriate question to ask because it's leading? I, you know, and I'm bored. You know, and I'm a dork. I'm, you know, 50 years old, almost an empty nester. So. <clears throat> I got time. I got time to be that disgruntled old guy. And rather than kick kids off and playing out in my front yard, I, I would rather give people a hard time that do surveys. Um, you know, these poor people are making minimum wage going, oh God, this is my first job I've had in 12 years and you're making, you're making me feel like crap. So, so it says in statistics, in statistics, and this is again on page 33, correlation is simply a number that is the measure of both the strength and the direction. Uh-oh, Ethan's got to move now. No, nope, Hayden found a new seat. Okay, so. So, if we're just focusing in on linear, we can get data 
that hopefully follows a nice trend versus data that kind of follows a trend. And no, I'm not drawing my X, Y axis. But then we can also get data that just, just is a blob of stuff. Okay? Now, we can even pick, as we had said before, we can pick two different things. High school GPA and caloric intake. And we might actually be able to find this might be a linear correlation to it. And those correlations might have a good R value. Okay, so the R value is something we've talked about a little bit, but the R value is like the residual value. It's basically almost the distance above and below. If you had a line of best fit, it's this these distances averaged up for the most part. In fact, you know, I could be, I, I can't imagine that I would have ever used this equation or done this equation even when we didn't have the calculators. But in order to find the R value, And then times, I ran out of room. So, and this square root sign continues over this whole thing. I just had to continue it down there. So what in the world does this even mean? Well, n is the number of pieces of data you have. You have something in list one, something in list two. You do have two different things. List one and list two have to be the same size. List one and list two act as your list one is your x point. List two is your y point. List one and list two right next to each other form the points that you would graph. So n is the number of points that we have. The summation of x times y. So if I take my x and y value of each one, multiply them together, add them all up, <clears throat> subtract the summation, so add up all the L1 terms, the x terms, times add up all the y terms or the L2 terms, all over the square root of the number of terms we have, times the summation of all of the x terms squared added up, minus the summation of the x terms quantity squared times, oh my gosh, I mean, it's just ugly. Like if, if someone were to ever ask you, you know, if you walk into a statistics class going, okay, we're going to find the R value, and here's 55 data points, do it by hand, drop the class. Okay? Yeah, it's not, it's not a real pretty thing to do. Statistically doing something like that, it's, it's just cruel and unusual. Now, the fortunate thing is our calculator does it for us, and it does it quickly. Okay, And that's what you want. You want, you want to be able to utilize the technology um, in order to do the equation. So just because you have two different things to compare doesn't mean there's some sort of correlation. Years ago, there was a study that was published by a lot of the national newspapers. Here, this is kind of funny. You realize that corporations can buy an advertisement on a newspaper page or a magazine page? And that advertisement can look like a real story. As long as there's not anything that doesn't fall within the parameters of the newspaper's guidelines, they can do it. So the National Grape Growing Association for the United States, people who grow grapes, purchased the front page of many national and local newspapers throughout the United States. 
and there was a big headline that said consuming one to two glasses of wine per day reduces heart attacks. What do you think happened with the sale of wine? It went up. Now, <clears throat> we read the article. The article seemed like there was some sort of study that had been done, but it didn't give any other specifics. So a lot of people chose, oh my gosh, hey, I read this article. Hey, do you see that article in the paper? Hey, and the newspaper used to be the big thing. Like nowadays, you see it on your phone. Okay, but back in the 70s and 80s, you know, you kind of look forward to that newspaper. Like, not me as a kid, but, you know, parents were always reading it. Grandparents would come to town, they'd read it. But it became this big thing where people were like, oh my gosh, I, I'm definitely, I, I enjoy wine. I didn't realize having one to two glasses a day was good for me. But the unfortunate thing is, the Grape Growers Association, the people who grow grapes, grapes, I don't know if you know this, but you smash them up and get the juice, and you allow it to ferment, makes wine. Huh. As far as advertising goes, it was genius. But they made a claim that it prevented heart attacks. Huh. Now, let, let's kind of think about this just broadly. Heart attacks do happen, agree? Yeah. Your age group has a lesser chance of having a heart attack at your age than my age group. My age group, you know, I'm 50. I'll be 51 in December. You'll find me again. Yeah, you did. But, you know, there's just definitely things I've done. Now, my, my, my biggest problem that I have is I enjoy chips. Enjoy ice cream. I don't eat the two together. I'll eat the chips first, wait about 20 minutes, and then eat ice cream. So, yeah, there are some habits I have that might not be conducive to the healthiest heart. But I definitely have friends that I've known. Unfortunately, I have friends that have left us because of things with their heart. I have friends that are used to be great athletes and now they are great eaters. <clears throat> and if you're a great eater when you're an athlete, that's great. And then you become just a great eater and you don't reduce your caloric intake. Bad things happen to your body later in life. So, um, so coming back, it should be noted that real world data is often messy and convoluted. Scatter plots that form such clear, distinct shapes don't occur. But by this, that is an exercise, an understanding that correlation and aspects of a scatter plot that they measure, the bottom row displays on, on the page 34, the bottom row displays nicely that zero correlation doesn't always emerge in random scatter plots. Okay? So if you're looking on page 34, they have the first one looks like a W, the next one looks like a square, square, looks like a smiley face, looks like kind of like an X, it looks like a Z, uh, letter O, or it looks like, I don't even know what that would be. But, I mean, if you see a pattern happening with a scatter plot, when you're plotting L1 and L2, and L1 is, are your X values, L2 are your Y values, and as they sit next to each other on the graph, they create ordered pairs, which are points. Okay? Now, you certainly can do things with your calculator, but if you were to plot your data, you know, 1, 7 is here, 2, 8 is here, 3, 6 is here, that's a nice line of best fit. This line of best fit would actually have an R value very close to 1. Okay? 
Are three pieces of data good to start making conclusions off of? Again, the phone surveys aren't real good. But then this would have an R value that would be very close to negative one. Is a negative R value bad? No. If the R value is positive, that means you have a positive slope to your line. If your R value is negative, that means you have a negative slope to your line. The closer you are to positive one or to negative one is really good data. The closer you are to zero means that you, you're not showing anything. And as long as you report that information, you can kind of create any story off your data you want. As long as you list your R value. The R squared value is not needed as often. And a lot of times people don't read the small print at the bottom of studies and think, oh, this is a valid piece of information. But if you list what your R value came out to be, if you list any of that information, and I know the other day we did height versus weight, or no, we did height versus shoe size. And it was we, we made it as men's shoe sizes because women's shoe sizes differ by a size of two. But we showed that we had some pretty good information. Let me see if I can even pull that up. I think I still have it here. Of course, it's going to take this a little long. They said we're getting new tablets. Us teachers are giving us new tablets, so we're like so excited. Life is good. Okay, I believe that was our I believe that was our shoe size chart. We talked about interpolating, which meant you were inside your data. Extrapolation, which is outside your data to make predictions. But I forget. Let me see. We did stat, calculate. Linear regression. Now I learned this morning, and this is the first time I ever knew this, there are two different linear regressions. Okay? This one has the A value being the slope, B value being the y-intercept. This one has the B value being the slope, and the A value being the y-intercept. Honestly, it doesn't matter which one you use, but I heard in like AP statistics, which this is not, they often use the number 8. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. But if I did the linear regression versus list one, list two, and I calculate it, our value of 0.82, again, think of that 0.82. It's, it's a positive 0.82 because my slope is positive. My slope is 1.06. Okay, 1.06 is a positive number. That means we have a slope that's positive. 0.82, is it really good? Well, it's an 82% on a test. Is that good? For some. So the more and more data we collect, hopefully the higher and higher or the closer and closer to 1 that R value becomes. The R squared value, though it is something that is used statistically, it's not something that they will always go to. So if you were to publish some sort of data, Let's say we were to write some article saying, hey, in Sturb's class, we took everybody's uh, height in inches and their shoe size based on the male shoe size. We found this on a study. Hey, one of you guys dropped a wallet. Okay. I cleared out the money first before I gave it back. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's, che he's checking. He's che I have to check. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> So, I, do that, but got a check. I understand, buddy. <laughs> so, so, friends, if I were to publish that paper about this class, which doesn't seem like a fascinating study, but I should put here's our equation, here is our, our value. Other things that we probably should put in there is the number of people that we surveyed. I should also put was it a voluntary survey or did stir up force people? Well, I first forced these first two rows with a threat that they would fail. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't remember that. But the story sounds good that way. Um, I know. I know. Stir up strong arming kids to get the height and shoe size. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of information that should be published as, as part of this. The unfortunate thing is people don't read that information. That's the small print. 
But it's stuff that, if you see something that seems like a wild adventure, look to see how they did it. So if I created something called a random stratified sample, would mean, okay, let's create a random stratified sample with all the students at Cherry Creek High School. You still with me on this? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everybody a four-digit number where 0001 and somebody who is at, you know, 3798, and I did a random number generator to figure out, oh, I need to get student 1173. So I find that 1173 student, give them a survey. Okay? Then I do a random, random number generator again. Pull up another four-digit number that's in, within our thing. Go find that next student. And keep doing that over and over. There are certain parameters that could take place because, one, it was random. It was random based on our population here. I don't know if our population here is indicative of the entire world, so we can't necessarily make the conclusion. I think that we'd all probably feel pretty safe to say the taller you are in inches, the larger your shoe size would be. Okay? Then there's always the outliers. You might have the person who's six foot ten who has a size five foot, but you also might have the person who's four foot eight who has a size twelve foot. So there could be outliers at either end. But again, this information is important. What else does it say? The correlation is a number that has no units of measure. So the R value doesn't have, you know, it's not meters per second or anything like that. As such, you can calculate the correlation between two variables. It doesn't matter what units the measure of each variable is used. In other words, if you create scatter plots of temperature to speed, you will get the same correlation if you compared degrees Fahrenheit to miles per hour, as you would Celsius to minutes per second. Okay, and then the main thing is, is and I'm showing it here, is the graphing calculator is a huge, powerful tool. But places where mistakes are made on the graphing calculator would be here. Okay? So a lot of times what might happen is you might mistype something in, the person with a uh, that was 63 inches tall with a size three shoe. That I don't remember who that was. That might have been a mistake on my part. But as you go through the data, you have to make sure your lists are equal in length. You have to make sure that what was in list one correlates to the same thing in list two, meaning the same person answer for list one for their height has to go to list two for shoe size, as far as the male shoe size goes. Okay, but a lot of times you get down to the bottom of your list and one list is longer than the other. Okay, think, go back to algebra one. If you're plotting points, you have three comma two, seven comma eight, twelve comma, I don't know. So the points have to match up. But there's different places that errors can be made. And there's been all types of ways where it's like, okay, how would I collect data to make sure it's appropriate? One, I can make errors when I'm plugging data into the calculator. I can I can misinterpret. I might flip-flop the person with a 66, 10 and a half versus and the person with a 60 size five, 60 and size five. I might accidentally flip-flop the 60 and 66. I might mistype the number. There's lots of places that errors can take place. The more iterations of stuff I do, the more likely it is that I might have made an error. And I remember when I was doing stats in college, what you would do is you would partner up, and we were doing this by hand. You weren't on a calculator. Um, they did. Excel had come out, but people didn't understand how to do the formulas on Excel. But when you went through this stuff, you, one person would read it, one person would type it in or write it, and the third person would repeat it to double check it. And that was something you put in as far as the study went as well. 
But it's just one of those things. Is there going to be a correlation between two separate variables? It's very possible. Is it possible that somebody wants to determine how many ice cubes are in an ice cube maker versus how big the house is? I don't know if that makes a difference. Okay, someone might have emptied out their ice cube tray because they filled up the cooler because they're going to go on a picnic. So you, if you went to their house and said, oh, you only have three ice cubes, but you live in a 5,000 square foot house, that doesn't make sense. Oh, well, we emptied the ice cubes out. So there's different things that you can definitely try and pick that aren't going to make 100% sense as things go on. So, um, again, so the R value can be positive or negative. It will not be larger than 1. It won't be smaller than negative 1. The closer it is to 0, the less linear your information will be. Scatter plots can look like anything. Just because you compare two things doesn't mean it has to have some sort of correlation to it. Okay? You know, how many cars are in a state versus the elevation of the state? Of each state. Well, there might be a lot of cars in New Jersey, and the elevation in New Jersey is like 500 feet above sea level at the highest point. How do I know that? My parents pawned me off in Jersey all the time as a kid. <laughs> I hate them for that. Still, I'm forgiving them. Yeah, you're going to go to your grandma's house in New Jersey. Oh, but grandma still works, and grandpa still works, so Florence is going to watch you. Oh. This sounds really good. Grandma and Grandpa live out in the middle of the country. Oh, but it's really humid. Oh, don't go in the forest because there's ticks. Where these ticks you speak of? We have scorpions and black widows, and rattlesnakes, and gila monsters in Arizona. What's a tick going to do to me? It can kill you. Oh. <laughs> And you remember that grandma only has the window air conditioning unit up at the back and up in the bedroom. So the rest of the house, it's 95 degrees outside with 99% humidity. So the whole house feels like that, unless you go up into the bedroom. Sounds like a pretty great summer, doesn't it? That was every summer for five years in a row. Okay, it's the first day of summer. Hey, guys, what are you guys going to be doing? Oh, we're going to do this and this and this. Oh, that sounds awesome. What are you doing, Storp? I'm going to be in New Jersey, in the country. I can't go into the forest because there's ticks. Oh, I don't know how I went on that tangent. I'm sorry. <laughs> <sighs> I'm out of control. All right, so let's give you all this. Boom, boom, boom. So here, what do we say we do? I think it's page 141. And 142, which is worksheet 2.2. And again, if you still need to finish a test or quiz or you need to do a test or quiz, my timetable isn't like a lot of teachers. I don't mind if, you know, I know there's some teachers that act like if you miss a day of school, if it's not made up within the first 30 minutes of you being back at school that next day. You fail no matter what. I don't know how those teachers deal with all the parent phone calls. That's, that's ridiculous. So, 